Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. I am going to try and get the video uh, to work, um, but we're going to start in just one minute. But um, the video is the least <laughs> least important thing. So um, if that's not going to pop open, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. We're at 9.04. Uh, and we have a great number of participants. Um, and so I think I will just go ahead and get started with um, um, thanks to uh, all of you for being here this morning uh, and this afternoon. <clears throat> uh, this is our, as you can see, evidence to action webinar uh, focusing on uh, Wasutu and the just remarkable uh, accomplishment of the government of Lesotho, the Ministry of Health, uh, and many other uh, partners. And that's what we're focused on for the next hour um, and their achievement of the UNAIDS uh, 909090 uh, targets by uh, 2020. Um, my name is Chip Lyons. I'm the president and CEO of the Elizabeth Glazer uh, Pediatric AIDS Foundation. I'm delighted to join you today. Um, I, it, it's just, it's particularly important. Everyone on this call is just um, constantly working towards achieving goals and addressing problems and, and so on. And um, it, it, it's, it's just, um, we have to pause from time to time and reflect uh, both on things that don't work, but reflect as well on our successes um, and as well as to celebrate those successes. Um, I don't think we do that uh, often enough, and we're glad to provide that opportunity uh, today. Um, this milestone in Wasutu um, is uh, very much a testament to partnerships and the power of those uh, partnerships that bring governments, communities, health organizations, donors together around common goals. Uh, that is how APAF works. APAF is proud um, to work alongside the Lesotho Ministry of Health, uh, alongside PEPFAR, CDC, USAID, uh, communities, and others, as we keep uh, pushing and fighting for an AIDS-free generation of Lesotho um, uh, around the continent and around the world. As you all can readily imagine, getting to 90-90-90 was no easy task. Um, and with Sutu's ability to adapt services and to innovate approaches to meet the specific needs of children, youth, families impacted by HIV and AIDS has made all the difference. What we have to do is uh, capture this experience and apply these learnings more uh, broadly. Um, no one needs to be reminded of um, the effect that COVID has had over this last year, and that um, the progress that we know is possible can never be taken for granted. Um, there are no guarantees in the, the efforts that we're, we're making. And so uh, to that end, we look forward to further collaboration with um, uh, these partners as we uh, persevere in what is a mission for the Elizabeth Glaser Pediatric uh, AIDS Foundation where we can create a world where there no other mother or child or family is devastated by HIV and AIDS. Uh, I will quickly just introduce the panel and then I'll turn it over to uh, Sapong. It's a very uh, impressive, knowledgeable uh, group of speakers um, who have been the leaders in uh, Lesotho. Um, Sapong Malomi is the EGPATH Lesotho Country Director. Uh, Ian Membe is the USAID Deputy Country Director. Dr. Esther Tumbari is the Technical Director for EGPATH in Lesotho. Mamelo Sukese is uh, EGPATH's Project Director. Dr. Lucy Mapota is the, uh, with the Ministry of Health, representing the Ministry of Health um, for Lesotho. And Kindi Wabaha um, is with us and will share a client perspective as a part of the uh, discussions. Um, I think by now everyone is super familiar um, with the ins and outs of 
uh, Zoom meetings, please use the chat function to raise questions so that they can be brought forward uh, and discussed. I think all of us uh, have learned a lot from this uh, patient-centered uh, response in Lesotho, and we hope you as participants who have joined us um, uh, will enjoy hearing about these approaches, we'll ask questions, and we'll get to know this remarkable team and, and group of partners uh, in Lesotho. So with that, allow me to turn it over to uh, Tsipong, um, uh, including with my congratulations, Tsipong, to you and the team and all the partners um, for just remarkable work. Tsipong, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Chip, and good afternoon and good morning to everyone. So I will be taking you through the next set of slides. Um, next slide, please focusing on partnerships that drove Lesotho to realizing the significant milestone of achieving the 1990-1990 UNAIDS targets. Just a quick recap, Lesotho is a beautiful mountain kingdom completely landlocked by South Africa. It is home to just over 2 million Basotho. The HIV prevalence rate is 25.6% and um, HIV related illnesses are a leading cause of death. The HIV incidence rate is reported at 1.74 per 100 person years as of the last um, population-based HIV impact assessment conducted in 2017. Sadly, we are seeing that um, women are more affected by HIV compared to their male counterparts. And similarly, young women have a higher prevalence compared to their male counterparts. Lesotho has made significant strides in reaching 85% coverage for PMTCT services, that is the prevention of mother to child transmission services. Next slide, please. Since opening its doors in Lesotho back in 2004, for ECPAF has enjoyed a great relationship with the Ministry of Health as the custodian of the health system. This facilitated key partnerships with other key stakeholders, such as the Christian Health Association of Lesotho Chal, which provides services to over 40% of the population, as well as Tepong, which manages the tertiary care under a public-private partnership with the government of Lesotho. This great experience enabled ECPAF support to filter through from the Ministry of Health national programs to district health management teams, as well as further down to facility managers, where our teams work side by side with the Ministry of Health, CHAL, and Tepong staff. Through the years, the ministry has ensured an enabling environment through its flexible and strategic leadership that adapted to favorable policies, guidelines, and protocols for quality and patient-centered health and HIV services to Basut. Next slide, please. Without the generous support of our donors and development partners, ECPAF's support to the ministry would not have been possible. And for this, we are forever grateful. Our biggest source of funding in Lesotho has been through PEPFAR, both through the USAID and CDC. This support enabled us to jointly together with our consortium partners deploy over 1,400 staff that work side by side with the Ministry of Health, CHAL and Tepong teams while also building their capacity. The presentations that will follow from my colleagues will provide an array of very interesting initiatives that were implemented through the PEPFA support. ECPAF has also enjoyed support from other donors such as the in-kind support from the Global Fund um, where we support the workplace programs, support from um, UNITAID for our pediatric HIV and TB care, support from Johnson & Johnson for pediatric and adolescent services, um, support through CFED for research and UNICEF for, 
uh, provider initiated testing and counseling for under fives and other um, donors as well, where we have leveraged the PEPA platform to optimize the gains to making progress towards epidemic control. Next slide, please. Collaboration with our civil society organizations has been pivotal in ensuring the program is embedded on the community platforms. I would like to recognize and acknowledge the great work of our consortium partners, starting with our testing partner, the Lesotho Network of People Living with HIV, Linepua. Our community partner, the Lesotho Network of AIDS Service Organizations, Linaso. Our key and priority populations partner, the Lesotho Planned Parenthood Association, LPPA. And our pediatric care and treatment partner, Beila Lesotho. And lastly, Sintubali, who we collaborated with in efforts to strengthen our adolescent services. Collaboration with other implementing partners has been essential to ensuring synergy in implementation while reducing duplication. So at this point, I'd like to make a big shout out for the collective efforts of other implementing partners in country. We also enjoyed working together with the UN organizations, including the World Health Organization, WHO and UNAIDS in jointly providing technical assistance to the Ministry of Health. Indeed, all these partnerships were critical in the journey towards the 1990 targets. Next slide, please. Key and central to all these efforts has been our patience. Reaching the 1990 targets would not have been possible without Basutu taking control of their health and well being. It certainly would not have been feasible without Basotho heeding the call from then Prime Minister in 2016 to get tested, know their HIV status, and be initiated on treatment immediately. We applaud all our clients for having entrusted our health professional, hence being retained on care and achieving viral suppression. At this point, I would like to introduce to you Ian Membe. As already indicated, Ian is the Deputy Country Director for USAID in Lesotho, and he will be take, talking to us on behalf of the PEPA USAID and CDC teams in Lesotho. Ian, thank you for gracing this event with your presence. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pan, and uh, thank you to the team and everybody who has coordinated uh, to bring us all together to reflect uh, on this great journey that still continues, uh, but for which we are grateful for the progress that we have made so far. Uh, like uh, Mr. Pang uh, correctly said, I'm representing the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief uh, Program here in Lesotho, and we have colleagues uh, who are in attendance uh, from, uh, from the different agencies. So I'm from USAID, and we have colleagues from the different agencies as well as the Paper Coordination Office. The power of partnerships. Uh, I said I wouldn't do any slides because I just want to talk um, kind of from the heart and uh, speak to some of the things that have been very impressive uh, for things that we have seen and have been able to do uh, to lead us to this point that we celebrate today. Obviously, the initial partnership that makes the biggest difference is the, the partnership with the, with, the, with the communities that we, that we serve, the health facilities and um, uh, the workers in the different places uh, that are, you know, running day in and day out to make sure that things happen and getting the messages out. And then working with the different structures of the Ministry of Health, where we see all the intricacies, uh, you know, and the collaboration that we have seen, the policies that we have changed, everything turning uh, as we go. The Lesotho has been privileged in that working with the Ministry of Health, we've been able to make uh, different policies to happen, and and uh, colleagues at uh, at EGPAF have made this uh, look so much easy, uh, both in terms of their interactions uh, with the different wings at different levels, whether we're talking about district level or at government level, at central level, they've made it look so easy. But that has helped us to to work together as a team. Um, at the interagency level and working with PEPFA and working directly with EGPAF, we've been working with EGPAF here in this country. Uh, for at least 10 years now um, and uh, moving the program forward. 
with the treatment programs and introducing various initiatives and various programs along the way. Uh, so this is how I take it. So every time I walk into um, a health facility and we do, and hopefully we'll be able to do more of that soon. Uh, we do uh, site visits and we go to the health facilities. The first question that I ask is how many children in this health facility have been born with HIV in the last one year? And usually, especially if you go out, outside uh, in the outskirts, they'll tell you there's only maybe one, maybe two, or maybe even zero. And in most cases, they'll know their names, they'll tell you where they are, and sometimes they'll, they'll point them out at you. They are, they are playing over at school. And uh, it's a testament to how, how much an impact the PMTCT program has had and all the work that we've had that uh, at this point, we get so few those who are born positive uh, as well as those who are HIV positive. And it's a testament to the, to the impact that this program has had. That has led us to reach the first 90, uh, go past the second 95, and also made good progress uh, past the, the, the third 90 uh, across the board. Having worked with ECPAF through the different initiatives and different programs, and sometimes, you know, we give them long acronyms. Uh, for example, we have the Accelerating Lesotho's Progress to Epidemic Control through Health System Strengthening and Delivery of Comprehensive HIV TB Services, which is the STAR L2 project, a uh, continuation uh, under CDC. But we also have the Providing invest Investor Services for HIV AIDS in Lesotho, which is the PUSH project under, under CDC. And with the projects that came before those and the ones that we are running now and continuing. And on top of that, we add so many other initiatives. You know, we introduced cervical cancer, we introduced other initiatives. And we've been impressed with how um, the partnership has worked so well. So here are a few things that I've come to notice uh, working with partners and especially working with EGPAF, the agility. We throw so many and so much at the partner, but they're able to turn around things very quickly. And every year we are changing, uh, you know, budgets. We are changing. Um, they are working through multiple agencies and still able to negotiate uh, the two projects I, I talked about. USAID works in six districts, uh, CDC in, in four districts, but they're still able to manage across the board and make sure that everything works and all the policies go across the same way. They, the two agencies don't exactly work the same. But through those relationships, we are able to also work together very well at an interagency level through the USG uh, uh, platform. And that has helped us to move further in a number of ways uh, for the many things that we've been able to do uh, working together. So really, we have seen uh, great progress. And uh, also working across partners, uh, like Mr. Pang has said, we have uh, sub partners. And uh, a big push now, you know, as we think about, we are reached 90, 90, 90, and we've reached 95, 95, 95. We're solidifying our program and ensuring that we are moving towards uh, sub partners and local partnerships and capacity building in those directions. And EGPAF has been first to ensure that we move some of the activities to mothers to mothers, to Baylor, for those uh, local partners to begin to take on those initiatives. And they do mentoring at the beginning and so those partnerships become the, 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 the strength and the backbone for how this program moves forward. And we have hope that these partnerships that have been forged as well as those that continue to happen because of this are building us to a future that is sustainable for the HIV AIDS program uh, here in Lesotho. And thank you very much to everybody who has been contributing across the board. I know most of you are in this room. Um, I, would, I, I would spend another hour mentioning every single one of the partnerships that we've been involved in. Uh, sometimes we put in, you know, funds for WHO, uh, for, you know, maybe it's a drought response program. Um, they've, they've been working with funds from UNICEF and still able to do all of this very seamlessly and move the programs forward up to this level. So what am I saying? Partnerships are important and partnerships are impactful. And Lesotho is a place where we've seen and working with, uh, with programs and, uh, and partners like EGPAF is evidence that partners, partnerships do work and partnerships are, are impactful and they will lead us to a, even a more sustainable program uh, here in Lesotho. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I'll hand over to Dr. Esther Tumbare uh, for the next uh, presentation. Oh. Thank you, Ian, um, and good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's listening. Um, I'm going to give you a snapshot of some of the critical interventions that drop the success of the Lesotho program that we are celebrating today. 
Um, I think paramount to Lesotho's success was a very favorable policy environment. In 2016, the WHO announced new test and treat guidelines, and Lesotho was one of the first countries in the region to adopt these guidelines, which proved to be a pivotal milestone towards attainment of the UNAIDS 1999 targets. In 2017, with the recognition that um, we needed to improve access for testing for HIV exposed infants, we were one of the nine ECPAF countries to introduce an innovative way of um, testing for babies through point of care. Um, with the huge numbers of patients coming in under test and treat, we needed to provide services that were more client-centered. And in 2017, we started developing um, new innovations such as multi-month dispensing, community ART groups, and so on. Um, recognizing that we still had um, a number of our patients coming in with um, quite advanced HIV disease, in spite of the availability of test and treat, we went ahead in 2019 to develop a guide, uh, a manual and guide to guide the implementation of a package of services to target this um, population, which remains very much uh, at high risk of um, mortality. Um, even within the COVID environment in 2020, we were um, able to um, target our pregnant and breastfeeding women with, a, a, again, a new innovative approach to monitor viral load through point of care viral load, making use of um, machines that were already in existence in the country for point of care EID. Currently in 2021, we are in the process of revising our PMTCT guidelines in line with uh, recent evidence coming from the WHO. Next slide, please. So HIV testing and case identification are the gateway to accessing other HIV services. And in order to accelerate our progress towards the first 90, we've made some critical human resource shifts and fine-tuned our approaches to HIV testing. Um, in particular, we task shifted um, HIV testing services to lay cadres who were well-trained and continue to be mentored and coached by the more senior um, um, clinicians, um, leaving the nurses to focus more on art initiation and providing quality of care for patients who had already been initiated on art. We also um, provide, um, uh, put on some innovative approaches um, to ensure that all the patients that were coming to health facilities did not go away without knowing their HIV status and therefore placed um, lay counselors at all service entry points um, it, it all the health facilities that we supported. Index testing and partner notification was also added with the recognition that um, HIV is obviously passed on from uh, one person to another or from one person to several people. And uh, being able to identify all these people is really critical in terms of um, approaching the 1990-90 targets. Um, we also added HIV self-testing, um, allowing for um, those individuals who might not necessarily come up to the health facilities to access uh, provider-initiated testing and counseling to be able to test themselves in the comfort of their own homes. I've already talked about point-of-care EID, but another innovative approach that we used was recency testing. This is um, a method of testing people who have tested positive through rapid HIV testing to check and see if their infection is actually a recent infection or whether it's long-term. That way, we're able to recognize where the pockets of high incidence are within the country and target um, those areas with um, more testing as well as with prevention um, methods. Next slide, please. Data is um, an ingenious way of monitoring progress and enables timely cost correction and any uh, of any bottlenecks or challenges that affect ability to meet our targets. And our program has been and remains extremely data driven. Um, as such, we have been using um, monthly tracking of coverage of all service entry points, um, just to check and see if we are really implementing with, um, with fidelity. 
Uh, we've uh, used other approaches such as surge approaches, um, something that we dubbed the war room approach, just to ensure that, um, again, we were um, make, doing diligence in terms of um, really reaching all those uh, patients we're supposed to reach, uh, and especially in the um, uh, partner elicitation to reach partners of index patients. In all that we have done, we have continued to ensure the quality of services that are provided through uh, regular refresher training, uh, proficiency and quality assurance, and ensuring that we were maintaining ethical standards for any um, index testing that we're doing. Next slide, please. Once a patient has been identified as HIV infected, it is critical to ensure that they are successfully linked to treatment in order to avert any further challenges to their immune system. As such, we have um, implemented several innovative approaches to ensure access to treatment for patients that test um, HIV positive, including going out into the community where patients are being tested and are being found to be positive to initiate them on treatment at the community level. The SUTU is um, um, completely surrounded by South Africa, as Meta Bank said, with about 14 borders coming into the country, and we have a lot of movement of our people coming in and out of the country. Um, we, we, we have gone ahead to implement services that are friendly to these migrant populations to ensure that they, they will be maintained on treatment in spite of moving in and out of the country. Our women were very quick to um, adopt, um, uh, test and treat, and we saw a lot of women coming in once we removed the bottleneck of um, CD4. Um, but our men, uh, we had to do a little bit more to get our men to come in by um, establishing several male-friendly clinics throughout the country. Um, for our children, uh, we run what are called the aerial clubs. Um, these are clubs where children between the ages of um, six to nine meet and tell their stories and have play therapy and are educated about HIV and about adherence and disclosure in an age appropriate way. We also have our adolescent corners and run youth camps during the, the holidays when our um, adolescent patients are not at school and have even gone ahead to tertiary institutions to ensure that um, the young people who are in, um, in, um, in college and university are actually accessing HIV testing and prevention services. For our key populations, we have done what is called moonlighting, taking mobile services out during the night to hotspots where key populations frequent, again, just to ensure that we are carrying everyone um, with us um, um, to reach the 1990-90 targets. We also have a huge factory workplace um, a program in the country. Um, Lesotho has a big uh, textile industry and uh, um, is a source of um, income for the country. And these people at these factories don't often, um, um, often find it difficult to leave their work to go and access services at uh, public health facilities. Uh, and with this in mind, we have, um, with support from um, Global Fund, used uh, mobile clinics um, to go to the factory workplace to ensure that we're bringing services to them um, and they can just come out at tea time or at lunch time or take a, a quick uh, 15 minute break to come and access HIV testing at initiation prep, any services that, are need, that they need that are HIV related. And with all these interventions, we had a rapid increase in art initiation between 2017 at the start of test and treat, um, um, up to now when you are, we are now celebrating attainment of the 1990-90 targets. Next slide, please. So this slide just um, basically shows you all the um, great progress that has been made over the years. Not in terms not only of um, case identification of patients living with HIV, but also with a great linkage rates of over 100%. Uh, we had a lot of patients who had tested pre-test and treat, who were pre-art patients, who also came in after we announced to um, the public that um, art initiation was now open. You did not need to have a low CD4 count to be initiated on treatment. And um, this is the great progress that has been made um, that we're looking at today. 
I will now hand over to Dr. Mamelo, who will um, talk to us a little bit about how we've managed to maintain these patients on treatment and keep them in rotation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Esther. And I will be taking you uh, through the slides on DSD models towards retention and viral load suppression. Before I go much into detail on the subject, I will also uh, touch on the intervention whereby we were able to enhance the quality of care. And this was done through uh, revamping the filing and data systems that would enable us to monitor patients better. And uh, this was done through introduction of the electronic registers, which are currently running in, a, in 178 sites um, in country, of which 173 have a shared health record. And currently we are able to report, uh, 50 sites are able to report uh, directly from these e-registers. We have also adopted a SIMS model, uh, program optimization, as well as QI projects, quality improvement projects. And these are in, uh, uh, um, systems that, are enab that enable us to make sure that our program is actually of high quality. We also use uh, the SMS and the mHealth uh, technology to assist us in patient tracking. Um, we use this application to enroll all PLHIV, and this enables us to uh, follow up with patients to ensure that we send them SMS reminders three days prior to the appointment date. And if a patient misses their appointment, they are able to be sent an SMS to remind them that they have missed their appointment. On uh, patient missing, completely missing their appointments, we are able to uh, pull out the names of patients who have missed appointments, and therefore this list are used uh, by the community partners to ensure that tracking is done. So we we'll also uh, continue to implement uh, the guidelines and treating of patients with advanced HIV um, disease, whereby we have uh, fully integrated the care for comorbid, comorbid diseases such as uh, TB, um, cervical cancer screening, and its management. We have um, also ensured that our patients are actually on optimized regimens, whereby we have adopted um, DTG-based regimens, as well as ensuring that our children are more are on um, better formulations such as uh, lopina um pellets. We are continuing to scale up our viral load uh, moni monitoring through innovations such as uh, point of care, as Dr. Esther has already highlighted in the previous slides. We also kickstart a uh, follow up of missed appointments within the first hour of a patient missing the appointment. As earlier alluded, um, we also uh, do our first uh, attempt um, through uh, telephone. And should we not reach a patient telephonically, then we move uh, to physical tracking. Next slide, please. Now, uh, going into detail of the DSD models that we are currently implementing in, current, in, in country, we have used these models basically to ensure that PLHIV are served better as well as to reduce the burden on the health system. So EPPF, previous slide please, thank you. So EPPF has ensured that uh, three to six months of multi-month dispensing of art is done for stable patients. And this includes the migrant populations as, we're, as we have already heard that Lesotho is actually landlocked by South Africa. We also have our community partner ensuring that there is establishment of community art adherent support groups. And this serve as a, a, um, a support system to our patients in the community to ensure that they all adhere um, to that treatment and that they are also able to support each other in ensuring that they take that treatment well and as well as minimize the cost of transport in going to the facilities as one of them presents for follow-up and doing a drug pickup for the other members in the group. So um, we also do extended uh, clinic hours whereby we ensure that uh, we enhance viral load monitoring and drug pickups, especially for the working class as well as school aged uh, children. We have uh, integrated community outreaches that are run by the facilities that are supported where teams of clinicians as well as community partners go out um, to ensure that there are drug refills, testing, as well as other services being provided in the community. 
We have also kick-started um, community art delivery, whereby we are able to make sure that we deliver ARVs during outreaches as well as in the homes of our patients through home drop-offs. Through the three posts, NASA has indicated that we have 14 uh, uh, um, posts uh, in Lesotho. Three of those posts are able to integrate TB, HIV, and COVID-19 uh, services so that we are able to reach all our migrant patients as they go through these uh, borders. We also have a welcome back uh, to uh, care package. And this is basically designed for patients who would have defaulted their care. And this is whereby we have our clinicians, like the psychologists, ensuring that they provide counseling for patients who would have been returned to care. And if there are any other social issues that uh, may hamper or hinder uh, them from adhering to treatment, they are referred to um, social workers um, that are actually providing services in the communities. So we have our point of care viral load that continues to be provided for pregnant and breastfeeding women. High viral load uh, monitoring uh, services continue to be provided through Virebic clinics as well as uh, targeted for children um, as they come in for camps. And these are models that we use together with uh, the partners that we are working with. We also have uh, strengthened our treatment literacy, whereby we continue um, to make sure that our patients understand the U equals U messaging, whereby we, um, they are informed that when their viral load is undetectable, that means that they cannot transmit their virus to uh, their partners. Next slide, please. At this juncture, okay, at this juncture, we will look at um, the data slides, whereby we will look at a uh, first look at the multi-month coverage that we have had for both adults and children. And uh, we can see from the slide projected that we have come a long way and uh, significant strides have been made in this regard. As of um, FY 20 Q1, which is September of 2019, we have been able to start at a low 46% coverage for adults, and we ended at 86% uh, in um, September of 2020. The same picture um, is observed for children, whereby we started at a low MMD coverage of 6% in FY Q1 and ended at a high 53% at FY 20 Q4. Next slide. So looking at the overall uh, viral load trends in country, we can see that there is significant progress that have been made with regards to viral load coverage, whereby at FY18 Q4, we started at a low 56% coverage. Significant uh, interventions have been put in place and by FY20 Q4, we were at a high 86% of viral load coverage. We continue to ensure that we work with all stakeholders to ensure that uh, viral load coverages are improved in country. And we can see that uh, we also have very high viral load suppressions, whereby we started at a 93% of viral load suppression and we ended at a, a high 97% of viral load suppression in country by FY20Q4. Next slide, please. Now, looking at a specific population such as pregnant and breastfeeding women, we will see that we continue to have high suppression rates amongst this population, whereby for pregnant women, um, by September of 2020, we were at a viral suppression of 91%, and by December of 2020, we we're at 96%. Now we are uh, seeing benefits of uh, the scale up of POC viral load in this population, whereby in September we're at 66% at of viral load coverage, and in December we were at 69% of uh, viral load coverage. We continue to strengthen this aspect of patient uh, monitoring. Now looking at breastfeeding women, we continue to maintain the high uh, viral load suppressions whereby we were at 91% in September of 2020, and by December, we were at 97%. And we can also see the benefits of POC um, viral load, whereby we have been able to scale up uh, and improve our viral load coverage amongst this population from 82% to 86% by 
by December of 2020. Next slide, please. So at this juncture, I will hand over to Dr. Lucy Mapoda, who is uh, the Director General in the Ministry of Health. Thank you. Dr. Mapoda, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It is indeed um, a day of joy and celebration as we uh, celebrate the success that we have reached as a country to have 90% of our people who are HIV positive to know their status and to have 97% of those to be on HIV treatment and to ensure that 92% is virally suppressed. Next slide, please. This would have not happened if the Ministry of Health was not faithful to its mandate to develop policies and guidelines to guide the health sector for standard and smooth implementation, which will ensure universal access and health for all. The Ministry of Health strives to reduce mortality related to HIV and AIDS incidences. Our role is to create a conducive environment for healthcare workers to deliver health services that are client-centered to people living with HIV in order to retain them in care. Indeed, let me reiterate that we are excited to have reached a significant milestone of attaining the UNH 1990 targets with the support of all our donors and partners. Next slide, please. This would have not happened if the Ministry of Health uh, uh, was um, running a one-man show, but we were able to uh, realize early on that we need to collaborate with all our partners to ensure successful delivery of services countrywide. And uh, we had uh, uh, partners at, at different levels. We had ECPAF, we had Baylor to highlight, to mention a few. At the level of clinical partners, we have LENAS or PSI at the community level. We, we, we are very grateful to the donors that you know, enabled, you know, provided funds for our implementing partners to do this. We, had, we can't work alone as uh, HIV is not only uh, affecting or an issue of the Ministry of Health alone, but we were working with the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Local Government. Um, did you not skip the other slide? Oh, thank you. Yeah, next slide, please. We are grateful to ECPAF uh, partnering with the Ministry of Health. Uh, where ECPAF is our main drug clinical partner, providing support in eight of the 10 districts of the country. We have been supported uh, by ECPAF in the fight against HIV since the year 2004, and this has enabled us to achieve these targets with uh, the LIFIA preliminary results that we have just received or um, um, that show that we are at 97, 92% achievement of the targets. Um, indeed, most of the work was done through collaborative efforts by different uh, implementing partners, uh, staff with the Ministry of Health across all levels. As I have already mentioned, uh, nationally, district level, community, and all other sites, and especially at the ART clinics where HIV clan center services are provided to all people living with HIV. Without the support of community partners, as I mentioned, Lenaso and PSI, we could not be able to achieve all the 90s that we have as achieved at the, at the facility level. We would also like to recognize the significant role of our community partners for tracking our defaulting clients and returning them back to care. The, work, the good work implemented by our partners could not be possible without funding support from our donors, uh, Global Fund and FPAF. Next slide, please. We really appreciate and thank all of our partners for joining hands in the journey towards achieving the 1990 targets and towards epidemic control in Lesotho. It's like a dream, you know, in the early 90s, I have experienced the dark days of this pandemic, but we really are thankful that we have been able to realize that we can only stand when we are together, but divided we fall. Uh, if you want to go fast, go alone, but we have really been wise to know that if you want to go far, you need to go with others. Next slide, please. 
To have reached this epidemic control, it is not all work, all work done. The Ministry of Health seeks to focus on mitigating the negative impact of COVID-19 to protect the gains that have been made on HIV indicators to date. With the, mature, with the mature HIV epidemic, the Ministry of Health is readily to address key HIV comorbidities such as TB, which is also the leading cause of death for patients with li living, with the, uh, uh, living with TB and also with advanced HIV disease. Cervical cancer screening and treatment efforts are also a key priority for the Ministry of Health as a significant contributor to the burden of disease in women or of childbearing and reproductive age. Continuous smooth collaboration with partners to plan for a gradual transition that ensures successful sustainability should not be an option, but rather essential to protect all investments and the tireless efforts made towards realization of the 95-95 goals for 2030. Next slide, please. Before I thank you, let me introduce Kendi, who will actually be sharing her journey as she received uh, our services. She's the beneficiary of our services. So, Kendi, let me um, hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I would like to use my, my nickname, Kendi. I was born in 1997 and I am 24 years old. I am living with HIV and I am a single mother of a 16 month old baby. I got tested at a health facility and found out that I was positive in 2005. I was 18 years old. I mean, eight years old, sorry. It was only then when my mother disclosed to me that I was born with HIV and that she was HIV positive too. I was shocked. I was shocked that she knew and she never disclosed to me. My status, <sighs> but because I was still young, I took it easy. When I was in high school, I experienced stigma and discrimination, which hurt me and made me angry at my mother, wondering why she didn't tell me about, I mean, why didn't she use PMTCT to protect me from the virus? When I was, <sighs> Sure, sorry. When I asked her, she cried and told me that there was no PMTCT until 2002. From, yes. from 2017, I've been accessing you friendly HIV services from the Gotti Filter Clinic. The services are offered by young and friendly healthcare workers without judgment. I joined peer support group in the same year, before I thought I was the only child living with HIV, but at peer support group, I met some young people living with HIV like myself. As members of the club, we were free to share our experiences and challenges as well as solutions for living with HIV. I learned about treatment adherence and viral load monitoring. We were we all know that if the viral load is undetectable, you will not transmit the virus to our loved ones. We learn about disclosure and taking care of our loved ones and ourselves too. Next page, please. In 2019, I was expecting my first baby. She is now 16 months old. I always visited clinic and my baby was delivered in Scott Hospital. I adhere to my treatment and my viral load has always been undetectable. Because it's undetectable, I did not transmit HIV to my baby. After six weeks, my baby was tested for HIV and she was negative. She tested again at nine months and she will be testing again at 18 months. Right now I am given three months of tracks to reduce regular visits to the clinic. I never forget to take my daily dose because my treatment is my life. My ARVs were changed and I am now taking DTG, which I was told they were the improved drugs. Next page, please. 
As a beneficiary, I would like to thank all our healthcare workers, especially the adolescent corners. Their friendliness, in short, we did not miss our appointments, no treatment. When we are healthy, our next generation will be too. Today, although I have HIV, I have a baby who is free from HIV. AIDS free generation is a reality. Let us join hands for a hate for AIDS free generation. It starts with all of us, not only healthcare workers, but all us people with living HIV, with HIV. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Kindi, um, for sharing your life journey with us. We are glad um, to hear the story about your bundle of joy and hopefully she continues to grow well. So at this point, um, allow me to um, say a big thank you to all our presenters and um, allow me to then move on to be your moderator for the Q&A session. So we'll turn it over to our audience. And um, the guidance has already been provided in terms of how you should um, maneuver getting the questions to the panelists. We have been um, receiving um, some questions, so we do encourage that everybody um, participates. You have um, the Q&A box. We will be answering all the questions as they immediately um, come to us through the Q&A box. Um, if you opt to ask your question verbally, please ensure that you raise your hand and we will um, unmute you when we are ready for you to pose your question. And for those um, that have joined through the phone, please um, ensure that you click star nine to raise your hand. And again, um, we will let you know when you should pose your question. So at this point, we have received about four inputs and we will go through that. The first question is from David Allen. The question reads as follows. The term partnership is often used. Sometimes in the US context, it means getting buy-in to plans already developed. Can you comment on the US Lesotho decision-making process, the racial and gender dynamics of the decision-making process, and how the concept of partnership may have evolved during the collaboration of the many collaborators? So for this question, um, we'll have Ian Membe and um, Dr. Mopota comment. And I'll also ask um, Chip, our president and CEO, to also um, chime in. Ian, over. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, David Allen, for, for that question on partnerships. Uh, so indeed, it is a, diff a difficult uh, field to navigate. Uh, ensuring that all the stakeholders come to the table, but not only come to the table, their voice is heard. And not only is their voice heard, but uh, what they say gets implemented and gets actioned. Uh, in the context of HIV, as you know, um, this was set up, PEPFA was initially set up as an emergency response, and we still call it that. And it has evolved over time. Um, uh, initially, a lot of things were done, you know, just like funds arrived and push this, push that, get medications, get that. And uh, initially, that was a very difficult thing to do. But at the time, that was the necessary thing to do to get uh, people started on treatment, get messages out, to get people tested and knowing their status. And that helped us to move through the first phase. But as we began to evolve and grow, um, we started having much more lengthy now uh, planning meetings. So we have, you know, almost excruciating uh, country operational plan uh, development meetings. They will last not a week, not two weeks, uh, a few months at least. 
And uh, during that time, we are going back and forth with partners asking and checking and things to focus on and getting input. So it's civil society, it's implementing partners and everybody having a stake and a say, not only about the activities, but also uh, where the funding uh, needs to go. Some of it, obviously, um, we have to, you know, kind of say these are the areas where we are focusing on as PEPFA in this year. But within that, we agree with the ministries and ensure that things can happen uh, very quickly. So we wouldn't be able to implement those things uh, without, uh, without an effective partnership working. Over. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, Chip, um, can you comment? Uh, Sipang, I'm happy to, um, and thanks, David, um, for the question. I, uh, I note Ian's um, <laughs> comments. Um, it, 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 David, as you well know, it, it requires an enormous amount of, of flexibility. There are multiple changes. Um, and sometimes I even I'll subscribe to uh, Ian's word. It, it can be excruciating. Um, at the same time, when we've got the kind of goals laid out that we aspire to, um, we expect uh, both to be pushed, but we also expect um, uh, and need the kind of flexibility and, and adapt, uh, adaptability that uh, inevitably um, sort of characterizes the, 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 the partnership. So it, it's not easy. The, the programmatic challenges are substantial enough, but there are procedural organizational requirements and dynamics and external uh, pressures and so on. But at the end of the day, when there really is this um, incredibly strong commitment towards specific goals, uh, we as AGPAF are more than willing to care, uh, carry our fair share, um, uh, even more than that. And we're willing to find out, find the ways to be responsive and, and adapt those uh, partnerships. That's a very generalized answer, I, I realize. It's so specific to the country's situation, to the uh, organizations and donors and partners. Um, it is not easy. Um, you have to work at these uh, partnerships and this collaboration. But we're committed to doing so, and uh, we will continue to do so. Thank you very much, Chip. Um, in respect of time, um, I'm going to move on to the next question. So um, another comment from Katie. Um, great work reaching 1990-90. Can you talk a little bit about how you are shifting programs beyond uh, multi-month dispensing to ensure we are keeping progress through the pandemic. Um, Dr. Esther, can you take this question? Thank you, Matt Sapang, and um, thank you, Katie, for the question. Uh, we are definitely um, going beyond just multi-month to provide services that are more client-focused. Uh, uh, in particular, we are more moving more into the community to um, allow for patients to access their treatment closer to home. Um, there's also uh, a differentiated drug delivery um, that has just uh, started being piloted towards the end of last year, where um, there's lockers where patients can come in and pick up their drugs um, and so on. We also do deliveries at home for patients that are, um, find it difficult to don't have transport and so on, uh, pay need. Um, so there is um, quite a, a variety of innovations that we are doing to make our, service a, our services a whole lot more client-centered. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Esther. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, so an input from uh, Mema Maswati Kopeka. Thank you so much, Kindi, for sharing your story. It is truly inspiring and to the team for the amazing work that you're all doing. Um, I have a question in regards to the use of mobile clinics to reach individual, individuals at their workplaces, primarily textile factory workers. Are there ways in which individuals who test positive are linked to their primary health care facilities and how is retention in care monitored? Um, Dr. Mamenlo, can you take this question, please? 
Thank you, Mr. Bang. Um, so as Mayor indicated in the presentation, we have the workplace program. And in this program, we do use uh, the mobile clinics whereby we are able to um, find some of our patients who are working in the, uh, in the factories and they are tested. And in the event that uh, when a patient is tested, the, the clinicians or the, the counselor, which is a professional counselor, identifies that this is actually a known patient, um, the, the facility or the parent uh, site is actually called and the records of this patient are actually updated and this patient is linked back to the parent site. Should there be a need uh, for this patient to follow up at the factory workplace where we currently have private doctors providing services within uh, the, 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 the factories, such a patient is linked um, within the program in the factories. So um, the mobile clinics not only um, support um, the, the, the patients within the factories, but they also are uh, used to leverage on some of, uh, the, to reach patients that are actually providing, uh, like vendors that are actually working around um, the factories that they serve. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mamello. Um, a question to Kindi from Claire. Um, Kindi, has switching to DTG as a treatment option improved your day-to-day -day life? Kindi, over to you. Come again, please. So um, the question is whether now that you are on DTG, you feel yes. that there has been improvement of uh, on your day-to-day -day life? Oh, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, um, Kindi. Um, we are just um, five minutes um, past um, the hour, um, which is the time that we had allocated for this session. We have been re receiving a lot of comments um, on our Q&A, and we will ensure that we respond to all the questions um, that have been asked and they will be um, communicated back to um, the audience. Otherwise, as already indicated, the recording will also be shared. Let me take this opportunity to once again, say a big thank you to all our presenters. Um, thank you to um, the organizers for facilitating this very important um, milestone for the Lesotho program. Thank you, Chip, um, for the continued leadership and um, affording us this opportunity to um, celebrate as a country. And um, lastly, the Ministry of Health, um, Ian, um, on the PEPA team, Kindi, for sharing your story with us. And to you all um, who were able to take time of your busy schedules to join in and um, hear from all of us and continue to learn together. We definitely will be getting back to you with all the questions. Um, thank you so much. All have a wonderful day, a wonderful evening to um, those on the continent. Thank you. Goodbye to everyone.